Kia ora everybody, welcome to another episode of Boss of Knowledge. Um, we, we didn't do one last week because of, <laughs> of a silly mistake that I did, but hey, that's okay, we'll talk about it another day. Um, thanks for joining in and good morning, Tane. Good morning, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. It's, it's, a, it's a fresh Saturday morning here in Christchurch, so yeah, loving the frost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Minus four, bring it on. Hey. Um, Tane, since we've last spoken, what, have you, what knowledge have you put into your Boss, boss of Knowledge? Uh, I think for me, what I've taken away is how sometimes we focus on the theory a lot, but we don't think about the practical application. Um, in a couple of my classes, we've been um, we've had guest lecturers come in who are actually in the field doing the work that we want to do. And I think sometimes, you know, when you're studying, you do so much and you focus so much on the study side and the theory and the books, but to actually be able to apply it, I think that's where the real importance comes. You know, you can have all this knowledge in your head, but unless you actually apply it, it's not worth anything. And so understanding that is actually really valuable, especially as we're going into exam period. You know, we stress so much about, oh, I'm not going to do well on this exam. But the reality is if you're not able to apply it, it doesn't matter whether you get an A or whether you fail the exam. So it's just good to be able to put things into perspective before we go into exams. Yeah, that's, a, that's such an awesome learning because I think lots of people are very book smart, but they're not very practical smart. You know, you could smash your exams and go, cool, cool, got 100%. Right now, do this, like, oh, I don't know how to do it, which leads on to my learning, which is which is very similar to yours. Um, as you know, I also do coaching, and um, a lot of my clients that I coach are, are really very smart people. You know, um, they're very smart, but you go, okay, why, why aren't you doing what you want to do? Like, for example, someone wants to get fit and healthy. They know exactly what they need to do. They tell me exactly what they need to do, but they don't do it. I'm like, cool. So you know exactly what to do, but why aren't you doing it? And it all comes down to mindset, right? It's all about mindset and where you put your priority. So, you know, we all will go, hey, I'm too busy to do things. But if you think about it, everyone in this life has got 24 hours a day. And, you know, it's just about how you use those 24 hours. And, you know, I guess we're all busy. We're busy people, but it depends on what priorities you want to you want to set aside for yourself. So, and again, I have to reflect to myself and, um, you know, I say, oh, I'm too busy to blah, blah, blah. I'm like, actually, am I really busy or am I just trying to tell myself that, which is why I'm not doing that. Thing. So, um, you know, I reflect upon that. And, you know, I try not to use the word busy anymore because it's a it's got a negative connotation, I think. Or, or actually, it's a self-fulfilling thing. Oh, I'm busy, so therefore I can justify what I'm doing or not doing. Or just try and get a raise. <laughs> All right, cool. Enough of us bantering. Um, so over the last two weeks, you've heard some awesome um, short series podcasts, which we will keep replaying. You know, we hope you've enjoyed that there. But today, we're not doing that there. We are introducing back our guests because we love guests. And as always, we have um, a fantastic human being on our show today. And you know, we never we are we are we are pretty lucky time myself to get to meet these amazing human beings. And I guess I'm a bit more lucky because I get to know them in real life before they become awesome human beings and become famous. And today we're going to welcome um Eloise Lancaster to our podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Eloise. Oh, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Oh, fantastic. Um, it's our pleasure having you here. Eloise, before we start our conversation, do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about who you are at the moment and what you're doing? Uh yes. Yeah, so uh, right now, I have just started a new job a couple of months ago as a uh, entomologist, as a senior technician entomologist with the Ministry for Primary Industries. Um, so entomology is the study of insects. So insects are my passion, uh, of what I've decided that I really, really enjoy. Uh, and prior to starting this job, I just completed my master's, which was on uh, native ants in New Zealand. Uh, and just like some ecology details about that. Um, uh, and then before that, I did uh, my undergrad was in Otago as well as my master's, and that was on ecology and genetics. And even before that, I met Prajesh six years ago. So, <laughs> yeah. Six years ago, crazy. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for, um, for explaining what entomologist does, um, because, you know, someone's like, oh, entomology, what is that? Mm. But uh, that's awesome. Um, your passion is insects. But it, when I met you six years ago, what would if I said to you, hey Eloise, you're gonna be your passion is gonna be ants? What would you have said to me? I think I would be quite confused. Uh, I must say, uh, it's definitely I've definitely had a passion for ants my whole life, but yeah. I don't think I realized that until um, the middle of university. Um, when I met you, my my driving passion 
uh, was more about um, the social aspect of, of life. And I really wanted to work on social change. Um, I was, I think I, I was looking into studying sociology or gender studies and things like that. Uh, and I thought that that was what I would dedicate my life to. But, um, you know, as you turn out, you actually have quite a few different things that motivate you in life. Uh, and depending on who you meet and what you get into later on in life um, can really dictate or help you decide what you actually, um, not as much uh, makes you motivated, but what brings you the most amount of joy, I think is what um, changed that for me. And that's, that's really um, quite a, a valid point there. What brings, you, what brings you joy versus what brings other people joy? I think um, a lot of us, when we're doing what we do, we, we, we focus on what others will think about as opposed to what we think about it. And you know, like you said, when, you were, when I met you in year 13, um, social justice was the way you were going. And if I, if I reflect a lot of year 13s, you know, in your year 13 year, everybody wants to change the world because, because of, of various things there, you know, because of the way the, the media portrays the world and in those final years of school, a lot of social justice is put in, put in front of you. And if you think about that there and you go, all right, cool, there was no right or wrong at that point in time. What was your, what was your, your driver for your social justice? Was there anything in particular that was your, hey, this is why I wanted to help change the world? Yeah, oh, at the time, um, particularly in year 13, what I was getting uh, very involved in was the um, queer student scene, the queer student social leader scene. Um, so in my school, I started leading um, our QSA uh, with some friends and uh, there was a network um, within Wellington for QSA leaders around different schools. So we had a lot of meetings and we got to know each other and we made a lot of plans about what we wanted in the future and worked on a lot of projects at the time. So I think in my final year of school, I went to Wellington Girls College and um, it was the efforts of me and the other QSA leaders. Uh, we helped, we decided to pass the, um, uh, the, the proposal to introduce pants into the uniform for one thing. Um, and also changed all the signage around our bathrooms um, to make them gender neutral, uh, which was like really big projects that we wanted to do before we left school. Uh, and that was really, really important to me. And that was a lot of um, a lot of all my friends, all my collections were really deep into that world. And I thought that I wanted to really continue um, doing that kind of work outside of uni. Um, and then I got to uni and I was like, oh, but I'm also really interested in science and uh, intellectually, and I'd like to um, learn more about that. And then I just got really, um, my perspective changed from just what my world was at that time and who I was in, in school, um, being like one of the most out people in school uh, to the point where like the dean would call me in if she had like students getting bullied, she'd be like, Eloise, what should I do? And I was like, I'm 17. Um, I shouldn't be telling you how to deal with bullies. Um, but yeah, once I started uni and I started learning more about science, I started learning more about um, the environment and the world around us. And um, I decided that actually what my driver at that point in my life was about um, environmental issues and climate change and what I could do to try and uh, well, not alleviate that, but I wanted to know more about it and I wanted to know more about that issue. Um, not that I stopped caring about the other issue, but I think my perspective um, changed to actually I'd like to just exist as a queer person for a few years and not like um, try and fight tooth and nail yeah. continuously um, and just enjoy my life um, for a wee while and not take that responsibility so much onto my shoulders which is something I would like to look into later in life, uh, hopefully when I have more resources as an adult. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting how that can um, shift when, you, when your world widens and you learn more about what's around you and um, what's happening around you. And, and I guess you, know, you can also say that the two can actually coexist. Mm. You know, when, you're, when you're a younger person, you think, oh, we, we all think that it's gotta be one or the other. And actually, you know, your your social your social justice and your social reform doesn't have to affect what you study at university, what you study wherever you go, because it is it is part of your values. 
And I think sometimes we get mixed up with wrong values versus what we'd like to study. They could be two totally different things in terms of where they stand, but they use still the same human being. And I think that that's great awareness that you realize that when you were at university, because um sometimes you 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 not you we as, as people we forget the, our values we take them on so um so much and we get affected by them we, we take them personally mm. we actually explain it's not a personal thing it's a it's a greater thing but before we talk about that there talk let's talk about your, your your impact at Wellington Girls when you left did you manage to to pass those um pass those um things you spoke about the, the pants and the gender neutral bathroom Oh, I certainly hope so. I had some absolutely incredible uh, students who were coming up behind me, yep. some younger students, and I know that they would have done just an incredible job um, fostering that kind of just a, that kind of care within the yeah. school environment. Uh, and the pants did get brought into the uniform. It was very exciting. Um, they made a uh, like <laughs> like a collot version of the skirt for starters. Um, almost, it was quite ugly, almost as if, because their, their main argument was like, oh, if we introduce this into the uniform, no one would buy it. Um, it would kind of be like, you know, like if you were pants, you'd be outing yourself and, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be great. Um, but obviously people did buy it. And then every, like I've been returning home every year and my mom would be like, Eloise, have you seen the new Wellington Girls students? They've got like real pants now which is so exciting. They've got like long pinstripe pants that I see around town just like most, not most, um, but about, I don't know, 30% of the students wearing. And I look at that, I'm like, that was my impact, me and my friends. Um, and that's just so exciting to yeah, well see. Done. Well yeah. Done. Well done. Um, and you know, I find, that I find the irony when it comes to school uniforms, especially for say Wellington girls is that, mm up to year 13 you can, you have to wear a skirt previously but then when you get here that you were we can whatever you want i was like isn't that an irony right there you know you can go to mufti in year 13 or you know civilian clothing but before that you've got to wear a skirt yeah Very crazy yeah it's odd it's like you have to earn your right to be comfortable at school yeah which is just really odd um it because in a learning environment you should be comfortable uh and you should be able to feel like you can present who you are um comfortably throughout where you spend like literally most of your life right. um with peers that you see every single day um yeah and if you're not comfortable in a skirt and if you know it makes you feel really bad or just you know you hate it um yeah. you shouldn't have to wear it just for the sake of conformity which exactly. in itself is questionable <laughs> exactly yeah well, well done you yeah. i mean that's obviously you know that's an impact right there even though you we were not actively in while you were at university or well, actively studying it the impact that you started is is amazing which is like the butterfly effect you know when you start something there's a movement out there that you know others others around you pick that up and this could be both good or bad right you know you know there could be good outcomes could be bad outcomes depending on on whatever whatever the, the thing is but in your case it was a good outcome which is which is amazing so you come to university with this idea of, of social justice. You come to university, you live in the hall of residence. Can you remember the time when things just shifted for you? When you were like, actually, wait a minute. Was there a moment when you went, wait a minute, the science is my jam? Because I know when I met you, you were always, you were in between the two, like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're doing a Bachelor of Arts in Science. And I was like, oh, pick one, pick one or the other. And especially because <laughs> it, it was the first time Bachelor of Arts in Science was coming along six years ago. I think that was, was just being introduced. And I was like, oh, I don't know which one to so, um, when did, when did that split for you? I honestly think it was one of my first ecology lectures. Yeah. Um, I I picked ecology at random. I think I discussed this with you because <laughs> um, I was like, I enjoy biology at school and I'm good at it, but I don't know what discipline I should go into. And I was like, well, this one sounds good. I'll tick the box. And if I don't like it, I'll change it later. And I sat down in my first ecology lecture um, and it honestly kind of blew my mind um, because I think before I was just uh, in school the version of biology that you hear is very much like these are the basic facts and we really don't talk about um, how research works or how it has implications within the world around us and that ecology is deeply set in um, the implications of the world around us because it's about how everything in nature is connected, basically. Um, 
uh, and about how everything in an ecosystem affects everything else. And that includes humans and how we live uh, and how we interact with the environment. And I just was fascinated. And I thought that was so interesting. Um, and uh, also it was just like really fun learning about nature, but it was also really gut-wrenching at the same time uh, because the more we talked about it in class, the more we kind of realized how much of an impact humans were having. Um, I think about halfway through the year, I started, you know, I, I was like, I've got to stop eating meat. I've got to stop eating fish. Um, I know that was, that's not like, you know, that was just me personally having a crisis. Um, <laughs> but um, learning things about like the statistics of, of human fishing impacts, particularly around New Zealand or um, human impacts uh, through like farming intensification uh, and what that means for, you know, the ozone layer and what that means for our water use and what that might actually be affecting um, within ecosystems, which had never really mattered to me because I never really knew much about it. Um, but the more you learn about it, the more you care. And I think in um, contrast, I was going to my sociology class and my sociology class was a beginner's class and that was mostly stuff that I knew. So I was less gripped by that because I was like, this is, this is what I'm aware of, but it's also like just very depressing. Um, <laughs> and it doesn't have the kind of, um, I don't know, the wonder, I guess, that, um, and the in interest that nature has to me. Um, so I switched from sociology to English because I also really like English and that was really fun. Did an English paper, read some books, really enjoyed it. But again, it didn't have the same grip on me as, um, ecology did. So in the end, at the end of the year, I was also doing some background reading. I was, um, reading some nonfiction, um, some science books. I was reading one about genetics, uh, called The Gene, which is a really good read. Um, and I was like, you know what? Um, also, this is also really fascinating. I think I'll switch and I think I'll double major in genetics and ecology and just have the arts as, you know, my hobby because I do, I do love it. But it's about what intellectually makes you want to learn more, I think, is what I realized later in uni. And that's why I switched entirely to science. And also, and you know, it's uh, it's you've you've articulated really well. You know, it's the inter intellectual challenge as opposed to the passion. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is a conversation I have with a lot of young people. But you know, they, oh, I want to do arts or music, and I was like, that's awesome. But is that because you you love it as a as a passion, or is it because you want to learn about it intellectually? And there's a big difference there. You know, like we said before, you know, you can keep enjoying your passion, but at some point it doesn't become intellectual. It's just you loving it for the for the for the thrill of loving it. Um, and that's 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 a journey that a lot of us face as we go through through life. Essentially, you know, you know, is it a hobby or is it a job? Is it a, you know, do I make it my job or would it be a hobby? And and sometimes the two to melt. You know, there's no right or wrong. Sometimes the two melt. You go, hey, actually, you could have been like, hey, the social justice is my jam. I really love it intellectually. Boom, bring it on. Happy days. And for some of us, it doesn't. But it's the awareness of, of that that's important, which obviously you had in your in your in your first year, which is which is awesome. Um, Talk about university. What what was the what is the biggest as you transition through through university? What was the biggest the biggest um, I guess the hardest thing for you as as a person as you went through university? You know, learning not just intellectually, but you as a young person now living in this environment where there's twenty thousand other people with all these crazy mindsets, with all these different ideas. Was it was it challenging or was it was it fun for you? I, I think... use it fun in a in better commas, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um... It is interesting to reflect on that. I think it was mostly just really fun for me. Yeah. Um, it kind of felt like a whirlwind, but in a good way. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those people who really like to uh, be doing a lot uh, at one time. Um, so I found it really, really fun. Um, of course, you know, workload and everything can stress you out and get you down and all of that. And it can affect you quite negatively. Um, I found that instead of um, uh, university itself being challenging, a lot of it was um, navigating, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like differences in, in more of the human side, like human connection and what might happen. Um, I've been at university, I was at university for five years. So um, I had a lot of time to meet people um, but also like through different stages of life, it's hard when things are not 
permanent, like when things are transitionary and people can move in and out of your life, which I found quite challenging. But also even in that five years, like sometimes you lose people and that could also be incredibly challenging, um, either through them moving away or even just through them passing away, uh, which did happen in my university career. And that was that was difficult, um, including one of my um, my lecturers, like my really beloved uh, lecture and my supervisor for some of my projects. Uh, so that was really difficult to deal with. Um, but I think what's very valuable about that experience is that you do kind of realize how much these people affect you in your life. Um, so it's like a really interesting period to be like, this is a crazy time. I met incredible people uh, and the effects that they how they've changed my life is like going to alter like my life for the rest you know literally the rest of my life so yeah yeah thank you for sharing that because like, i can see there was an emotion attached to that so thank you for sharing sharing that there and um you know it's like you said you know it, it's with university is life life is still going to be happening around you you know you'll be stressed about study you'll be learning stuff but life is still happening around you people are coming and going and which is why i find university so fascinating um, I've been working at universities for a long, long time now, for a long, too long. Um, but it's 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 crazy about the transition, the transition period that, that people come into your life, but the impact that they have in your life. You know, some of them will stay in your life forever. You are cool, and some of them will come in for two or three weeks or three months, and then they'll leave an impact, positive or negative, whichever it is. But there will be an impact, and then life, and you move on. It's just how you take that. And the other reason why I, I, I had a bit of a smile is because when you said you liked to be busy, Tane had a smile on his face there because Tane is the same. Tane, let's talk about you and being busy and how does that how does that work with you in your world and meeting people? I think, yeah, <laughs> I do love to be busy. Um, but I think, you know, as you talked about in your reflection and from your learning, you know, it's, you know, are we actually busy or is it just us making excuses to not do things? And I think that's why I try to be so busy is because I know if I really want to do something, I'll find the time. And I think people don't actually reflect on that. They just think, oh, I don't have the time where will I fit it in? But it's been really good to do many things because then you do meet a lot of people. And as you say, with the impact, you know, you don't realize the impact people are going to have on you when you meet them. You know, some people you're not going to remember and that's part of life but there's also going to be people that you meet for you know maybe a month maybe a semester and they have a lasting impact on you and I think even some of the things I've been involved with like camps for the week or going into um, primary schools and high schools you know there can be a small impact there which you don't re reflect on but then you see those people later on in life and they remember you and they catch up with you and you think oh I didn't actually think that that interaction was that important but to them it was meaningful because in their context it was you know through a bad place you were there to be nice and just talk to them you know so sometimes you don't actually realize to what extent your impact is and it's through being busy that it allows you to actually expand those networks as well yeah and it reminds me of, you both have reminded me of a quote by Maya Angela, which basically says people might not remember what you say but they always remember how you make your feet how you make them feel and you know like you both said you know you've all, all of us in our lives have met people we don't know what they've said to us whatever but it's the way they've made you feel that is that is that changes our lives either positively or negatively you know and i think that's that's both of you have mentioned that which is really really awesome and i guess if we take the way of the way the word busy you know it's just being productive you're just expanding your network and go hey i'm meeting xyz and we'll see what happens um one of the cool things about I mean, this is, for example, meeting you two in my life is pretty, is pretty, pretty impactful for me. Um, and I'm going to tell you where, where I actually realized the, the awesomeness of Eloise was um, during lockdown. During lockdown, an article came across my desk, um, on my, my screen, I guess, from the critic. And I was like, hey, I recognize that name. Um, Eloise, do you want to tell us about that, about that, that lovely time during lockdown? Oh, yes. <laughs> it was at the very start of my master's. Um, I had had about two months of my master's and then we were in lockdown. Um, and my master's was, as I mentioned earlier, my master's is on native ant species. Uh, at that time, I'd actually, uh, I'd actually changed my project. Um, it was always going to be on ants. Uh, so I collected uh, about, I don't know, about 10 colonies at that time. I, I dug them up out of the ground and like I'd put them in ant colonies and I was observing their behavior, which I was really interested in the behavior. 
uh, and then lockdown hit and I was like oh god I'm not going to be able to access my ant colonies because they're in the lab um, for however long and I also need to feed them I need to look after them otherwise I'll die and I won't be able to work on my project and it would just be a waste of space and I was talking to my supervisor we had 24 hours I was like Jenny what do I do and she said you know what go into the lab right now pick them up take them home and just uh, look after them at home and I was like okay cool um and my my flight mate my really good friend Frank I was like Frank I need a huge huge favor got in his car um went to the lab no one ever it was full of other like PhD and master students who were also panicking trying to like collect all of their samples I think one guy he'd had like six different bo bo boxes of crickets oh, wow. um he was running around uh no one was wearing masks but we all had like you know makeshift like scarves and stuff around our faces because it wasn't a mask wearing days um and I loaded about three of my biggest ant colonies into <laughs> Frank's car which was interesting oh, wow. because yeah. they're open top and <laughs> and I, Frank was like, I have to drive so carefully, otherwise it's going to be ants all over my car. Set them up in my flat. We had like a little weird, uh, our back door had like a weird bench, um, which we're previously using as like the gardening room. And now it's the, the lab. Um, and I recorded the tunneling patterns of the ants every single day. And I fed them every single day. Uh, and that was like my hobby over lockdown was ant rearing. And that was what kept me sane. <laughs> wow. And my, my flatmates were mostly fine with it. And they were like, they can't get out, right? I was like, no, they can't get out. Like they've got like a protective layer of, um, of you know, ant proof paste around the sides and it'll be fine. Um, unfortunately, March is, I didn't know this at the time, uh, but March was the time of the mating flight of that particular oh, species. Wow. <laughs> so at one point I had to go to my flatmates and I, I was very excited about it. I was like, guys, this is so exciting. My ants are flying. They only do this once a year. It's their flying behavior. And they kind of looked at each other and they're like, they're flying in our house. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah, so I had, to, I had to take them outside and I just like lay on my stomach for hours recording their flying behavior. My neighbors kept walking past, like, what? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yeah, wow. yeah. So that was, yeah, and then Critic contacted me um, and they told, I think I was under the impression that they were doing a piece on what different postgrad students, how they were adapting their research to lockdown. Um, but actually, they just interviewed me. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, why is this girl keeping ants in her kitchen? <laughs> that's, that's pretty pretty crazy. But hey, but you know, what, what a crazy um, turn of events for you, because I'm pretty sure if you were in the lab, you wouldn't be able to observe the flying behavior when we're doing that kind of stuff there. So oh. it's, you probably got lots of interesting data for your project, no. but also just for yourself. Well, it's huge that it's, yeah, that you'll mention that because they actually changed the course of my thesis. Um, because I was so fascinated by this flying behavior um, and they were doing other things in the flying behavior as well. Um, so uh, not all ants can fly, only the reproductive ants can fly. Um, so that's the young queens and the males uh, and the rest of the ants are the workers. Um, so I was watching them and then the workers were actually attacking the um, reproductives. Uh -huh. And I was like, what is going on? Um, they were like trying to prevent them from flying. They were like biting their wings and their legs and everything. And I was like, this makes no sense. Like these are your nest mates. This yeah. is a behavior that allows you to like extend your colony, like continue, you know, uh, what every, yeah. you know, evolution is based on. Um, and I met, had some, I talked to my supervisor about it and I came up with some theories and I got really interested in how ants communicate with each other chemically. Um, because that's how they recognize each other uh, and I actually altered my entire thesis to focus on um, chemical communication between different reproductives and ant nests oh, so wow. it was huge to me that wow. moment yeah what a, what, a, what a change hey what a, what a change and are you allowed to tell us what you've discovered or what you what you have found out so far <laughs> um, I can give you a brief I can give you a brief summary um, <laughs> So I found um, that the, um, the chemical profiles that 
uh, the different types of ants, the different types of reproductive castes have were very distinct from each other. But interestingly, because um, I had lots of different colonies of ants, different workers in the colonies actually have very similar chemical profiles. And what that kind of meant is that, um, uh, so the chemical signals encode lots of different information. They encode uh, genetic information. Uh, they encode physiological information, which is how you can tell the difference between reproductives and non-reproductives. Um, and they also enclose environmental information. So um, like what material the nest is made out of and what the climate is can really affect uh, the chemical odor of each individual ant. I was expecting that different colonies who had different environments and different genetic makeups would be really different, but actually they were very similar. Oh, wow. um, so that kind of made me think that maybe they don't actually have much of a genetic signature within their chemical profile. And that has a lot of implications for how they actually found their nest in the first place, um, where the multiple young queens found them together, even though they might be unrelated, um, which uh, <laughs> it's, there's a lot of background theory as to why that's interesting but basically if you have a lot of um a lot of queens reproducing in an ant nest you can grow the numbers exponentially um and there are other advantages for being genetically diverse in a nest as well um but it basically it affects how dominant a singular ant colony might be in their ecosystem and how well they can survive um, and compete against other like other ant colonies or um, mm. other ant species, which is huge for our native ants because they uh, are at quite large risk from invasive ant species, which are present in New Zealand, um, particularly around like the North Island. We don't see as much in the South Island because they're not very cold adapted. Um, but uh, yeah, invasive species can grow to gigantic numbers and just use all of those resources and uh, outcompete our ants even to the point of extinction uh, so it's was really interesting to me to learn more about um why we might actually have a chance and how our ants could be um like adapting to that or how they might actually be surviving against those those potential threats um so yeah that was kind of the point of my research oh, wow, uh, that's... And, yeah <laughs> That's pretty, pretty fascinating. I've learned something. I will always learn some, some stuff, but this is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and given this is going to lead me to my next question, given the fascination I see, why, why, why ants? Why, when did you, can you remember when you lost, when you first were like, hey, ants are pretty awesome? Uh, I think I was just always one of those children who would uh, at any opportunity be outside and watching like ant nests or, you know, finding caterpillars or snails or like watching spiders and webs and things I don't know why yep. just <laughs> um and it was just always a, a fascination for me throughout childhood um and my family uh helped foster that a lot they were really big on um uh learning more about nature my mum was had like a an interest in um nature and in the natural world as well so she like helped me learn like what all the trees names were and what all the insect names were and um uh things like that uh we'd go to Zealandia quite a lot um we go on bushwalks quite a lot uh, and I would always just think it was so so interesting but I, of course I thought it was normal um even though I would be like taking in jars of like giant centipedes into school and being like hey we got a, a like a new class pet and my teacher would be like oh <laughs> Maybe you should take that home. <laughs> and that's um, so, so crazy. I like how you mentioned um, you thought that was that was normal because it was your norm, right? And it's it's your norm, and I think that's important to reflect on that. We all have different norms, mm. and there's no right or wrong, right? It, it was what it was. It's the world you grew up in, and I'm sure Tana, you had the same thing growing up as well. Your norms were different to other people's norms as well. Or yeah, for sure. Yeah, even um, when I think about sports, you know, I think for me, sports is such a norm that I've been involved with and something I've always been interested in but now that I'm in my third year and doing placements in schools and you know seeing students that don't get involved it really interests me because I'm like in my you know in my school 
days, I was always wanting to get involved and wanting to do the sport regardless of what it was. So when I see these students that don't engage with sport so much, it's interesting to me because I'm like, why is it that they don't want to be involved? Is it because of the people they're surrounded by? Is it because they don't like the teacher? Is it because they don't like the sport? And usually it's a combination of all those things. And so that's really fascinating to me. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to try to find a caterpillar now. But it's this winter here, so I might not do that. But uh, um, one thing that that I that I would love to ask you, Elise, is how did you collect all your ants? Like, how did you did you just go outside and dig and start collecting ants? Or yeah, what is the method? Oh, I'll let you in on my trade secrets. Go on, if you trade want, secret. yeah. if you want to find ant colonies, what you have to do is you have to start flipping over rocks. Yeah. Um, and that's basically it. Because uh, they like this species in particular, like to thermoregulate underneath a, a rock surface and then dig further into the soil, and then yeah. they move their brood up and down depending on the temperature of and the humidity within the soil. Oh. Mm. So I spent t- uh, two two summers, one summer, uh, going around different places and flipping over rocks and hoping that I'd see their colony. <laughs> oh, wow. And then, uh, you, we have a tool, uh, and, uh, the tool to collect ants is called an aspirator and it's um, got like a rubber tube connected to like a, a, a puddle and, uh, by, and it has like a little, a very fine mesh in between that and the puddle and then like a, another like metal tube. And you literally have to put it in your mouth and suck in the air, and the ants get sucked into the into oh, wow. the bottle. <laughs> and it's really funny because I feel like an ant eater. <laughs> wow! Uh, I'd, love, very, I'd, love, I'd love to see you doing that there. Like, oh, what is she doing? <laughs> very high tech technology. Yeah. yeah. Um, even I would be doing it in public areas. Like, I one of my a res, one of my field sites was literally the Dunedin Botanic Gardens. So I would be on the ground in the Botanic Gardens flipping over rocks. I got my aspirator. I'm like sucking up ant colonies. It oh, wow. <laughs> would have been a sight, yeah. That's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty funny. <laughs> a lot of fun, I'm guessing, as well. And frustration as well at times. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dunedin, you can't, because it's so cold, not many ants around. Um, yeah. Yeah, it took me quite a while because I my goal was about 40 colonies and I did achieve that goal, but it took me quite a long time. How many ants uh, in a colony? How yeah, many uh, ants? That depends. Um, a colony is, um, uh, you need at least one queen yeah. uh, so the colony can survive because she's the only one who can reproduce. And uh, you need like her brood, which is like the larva and the eggs, yes. uh, and then the workers who can look after uh, the rest yeah. of the colony. And that constitutes a colony. So that can be oh, anywhere okay. from like, 10 workers to like thousands of workers gotcha gotcha okay cool oh well fascinating fascinating mm. um and then come back to your study so you know you you were going through this hey i'm doing science now you had these people that came into your life and human relationships are changing what made you decide to do a master's we we you know everyone's like three years i'm done finish see you later bye go by university and you're like actually i'm gonna stay for more what is what is that <laughs> what made you do that there well it was um uh, for me, my decision came after I did something really, really cool, and that was the uh, Brunei field ecology paper yep. that was offered um, through the university. So uh, the, my lecturer, Phil Bishop, uh, is an incredible, he was an incredible guy. Uh, he did pass away a few years ago. Um, he was incredible, and he was obsessed with frogs he was the frog man uh, he dedicated his entire life to frogs um and where you find frogs is in the tropics <laughs> and he organized this paper uh that he would select 10 students each year and take them to brunei to live in the jungle for four weeks oh, and wow. every night would go out and we would look for frogs uh, as part of a, uh, a long-term field study. We'd just like go down the river at like seven o'clock at night uh, and we'd memorize all these frog calls and we'd memorize what these frogs would look like and we'd have to catch them <laughs> and take the measurements and give them a toe clip so we can find them again. And it was all about 
assessing what kind of species were present in this particular river uh, and how that might fluctuate over time. Uh, but aside from that, he also gave us uh, the ability to perform our own research. So also it was in Brunei, like it was in the jungle and I'd never been to a place like that. And it was so full of life. It was incredible. Yeah. Can we, can um, we say wait just a little bit before we come back to that? What is, what yeah, is, yeah. Like? What, what is, what is Brunei like? What is, so, uh, you know, you get, a, you get accepted a couple of days and now you go to Brunei of all, of all places, which is not a place where people visit, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's not a uh, destination list. Brunei, what is that like for you? Oh, it was amazing. Because uh, the reason why we went to Brunei, not only because Phil had some connections there, uh, but because the rainforest there is, uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's about 130 million years old. Oh. So it's been untouched by any like palm oil plantations or anything like that. Like it hasn't been raised to the ground. It hasn't been, it's untouched. It's an untouched ancient rainforest. Oh. And that is because Brunei's main exports are from like off sea oil drilling. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you got to weigh it out. Exactly, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the absolute amount of biodiversity you, you can get from ancient rainforests is mind blowing. Um, so, also, just it has like some incredible, just some incredible stuff in it. And obviously, it has some really incredible frogs, which is why we went. Um, so that was what made it really really special uh, and it had like a field studies site which uh, researchers would come and stay in uh, deep in the jungle which was actually a really amazing facility it had like um, people it had like people who made you food there um, it had like a lab uh, we slept inside in bunks you know instead of like in tents it was two hours by river um <laughs> that was the only way you could get to it um uh, and we we would have um we would just we'd let, live there for four weeks um and we'd have like our lectures in the morning and the afternoon because we only had power on for two hours at a time each day uh and um the rest of the time we'd like uh do our own research or or we would just like sleep or swim in the river <laughs> you know do whatever we wanted basically yeah. yeah so that was my first experience with research and it was an incredible experience an incredible place to do research in uh because phil basically just said do whatever you want uh study whatever you want and uh the, uh, in brunei is a species of ant called the giant forest ant and the workers are about two centimeters long so about wow. this big wow. and that's the workers the soldiers are about three centimeters long because their wow. heads are huge uh and i was fascinated by them so uh i ran some i don't know uh, it wasn't a, uh, I, we didn't have any internet so it, i couldn't research them do any readings on them apart from like any readings that i bought in myself yeah. um so I was just messing around basically. I was um, trying to see what type of baits they would go for and how I can disrupt their foraging trails and stuff like that. And just running up and down the mountain trying to find ant colonies. You know? <laughs> how, how, how cool. And how did you feel when you were, when you were accepted? Like you said, just like 10 students. Mm. How did it feel? Like, hey, Eloise, you were coming along with us. What was that like for you? It, it was amazing because I had been... I'd really been working really hard to be accepted because it was my dream to go. Um, I was doing a lot of, I was doing a lot of volunteering in, in a different lab. I was um, trying to work on um, my uh, like experience in science and also my experience in like other areas. Um, I was also trying to save up at the time, like before I got accepted and everything. Um, I got a job at, <laughs> I got a job at a rest home as a bathroom cleaner, which was probably like the worst job I've ever had. But um, all my weekends were spent cleaning um, bathrooms of, you know, dementia patients, which was very mentally grueling, I must say. Um, but it was worth it because I was able to go. Uh, we had to like write a letter. Um, uh, it, we had to like apply. We had to like give our CV and like a letter and then, like I said, they only selected 10 students. Um, but the 10 students that went are like basically my friends for life now. Like we 
yeah, we got so close over that time and they're just incredible people. But the day that we got accepted was really funny because it was the, um, uh, the life sciences cocktail night, which is basically our ball for our discipline. Uh, and we got the letters like two hours before. So everyone turned out, got smashed. And we were like running around because all pretense was lost because like everyone in ecology, zoology applied for this, right? Um, because it was like everyone's dream to go. Um, and we were just absolutely off our faces either drowning our sorrows or just like super excited being like who got in who got the acceptance letter who did it and we like all 10 of us like found each other like in this um in the wow. ball basically it was like okay guys <laughs> great to meet you <laughs> this is a good start this is a good start to getting to know each other for like a month it's, yeah exactly yeah. wow how, how awesome i mean i can't even and I, I guess kind of myself can't imagine what it's like being in a forest you know you, you you have these images in your mind but you know a lived experience is totally different and i guess you know like i said before those people will become your best friend or they become your worst nightmare because you're living with people in the middle of nowhere <laughs> you know so that that sparked your interest into research and that got you into the masters and and voila but but i like i like what you said before that hey you this was a dream that that you wanted to come true but you did what you had to do you know a lot of people say to me i want to go to university should i find a job you can find jobs anyway it's just what you what you want to do right and um you know like you said you you said i did this job here in a dementia home which should be pretty tough um emotionally as well and mentally but you did it because you knew what your end, end goal was i guess yeah um here's gonna, here's a here's a, um, a curly question for you so you did your master's i'm sure you would have been um what's the word enticed or spoken to by other people say hey what about a phd did that ever cross your mind or is that something that you might leave for later on in your life oh well that's like the ever question isn't it, it? Is, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is i would love i think i would love to do a phd at some point because i did i love my masters i really enjoyed it um, the last few months where I actually had to write it up was <laughs> took quite a lot out of me, but um, uh, I did, I really enjoyed it, uh, and I did get a lot of encouragement from my supervisor and my examiners, which is, you know, great. Um, I, and I did actually put out feelers for potential PhDs when I was finishing my master's, but I think what happened was, um, the thing is, a PhD... Um, once you're in the kind of research world, you kind of realize how, how much of a failing system academia is, um, and also just how little the PhD students are valued, um, and how much they, they basically just do the most intense thing of their life for like three to five years, and then they get, like, they live off nothing, um, they get used for like free labor quite a lot of the time, um, and it, and it also is like mentally huge, the commitment. Um, and I, I, I think it was during lockdown last year, I had a moment where I was like, oh God, like, do I really, I don't think I could go, I definitely can't go straight from a master's to a PhD, like that would kill me. Um, I, need a, I need a break, I need to do something else, I need to earn some money or I need to go, you know, I, I wanted to see the world, uh, go back to the jungle, but um, COVID kind of, cut that a little bit like kind of killed the reality for that a little bit um but uh yeah during lockdown and I was kind of having a wee bit of a crisis I was feeling a little bit um uh I had a period where I wasn't working on my masters as much as I should have been so I was you know feeling a little bit odd about my life at that time lockdown's a really weird time and a friend of mine who was job hunting at the time sent me a job listing for the job that I'm in now the entomologist job and I looked at it and I was like this is like everything that I've ever wanted <laughs> ever wanted the job like this is like a, a pipe dream position for me um uh sure I was I was you know not doing too much on my masters at the time and I just put it all aside and I spent like two weeks putting my all into applying for this job um not at all thinking of the reality of what I would do if I got it um 
uh, and my supervisor was talking about me doing a PhD at the time, uh, and I had to be like, "Um, oh, so can you be my referee for this job though that I'm applying for?" And she's like, "Okay," um, and I got the job incredibly, uh, and then realized that when I accepted the job, uh, I said, "I said, well, listen, I know it's like August right now, uh, and I don't finish my masters until February." um because I kind of applied for the you know I didn't like yeah. think about the reality of it and they said that's okay they said you can have your starting day in March and I was like sure oh, wow. Brilliant. cool great what that meant was that I finished my master's I submitted the 26th of February and I moved to Auckland and then I started my job on the 1st of March oh wow <laughs> <laughs> um wow. <laughs> yeah Talk about so, no stress. Talk about zero stress right there. Yeah. Yeah, I literally spent the last few months recovering from that from that period. Um, yeah, but PhD would definitely consider on the horizon. Uh, probably once I've had some more. I think you need some life experience for a PhD. I think you need uh, that ability to know that that's really what you want to be able to do. Um, and maybe I might even do it through my job. Who knows? Like. Um, would I still be super interested in ants by the time I get to it? Will I want to do it in New Zealand? Probably not. Um, that's the kind of experience you want to have overseas. Uh, and I think I've kind of put that decision uh, to the side for now, uh, but I would love to revisit it, definitely. Yes, that, that question was not meant to trip you up, but it was actually, I wanted, it's, it's the truth about a PhD because um, nobody tells you about that. You know, it, it's, it's everyone says to you, hey, it's amazing, and, and, and the stuff that you mentioned is the experience that I had when I was doing my PhD. It's um, it's very isolating. It is very mentally tough. You're alone. You're you know even though you have the support structure, blah blah blah. You're actually it's very weak. If I'm being honest, and um, it is a very isolating isolating um, time of your life. And you do have and you as you said, you're doing your PhD plus you have to teach and all those other things as well. So you know it's it's a pretty full time role. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm glad I did all that. That's, that's fine. But when I reflect back and think about it, I wish I did what you did. Take a break. Take a break, go into some other things. And then also what I've realized is if I had to do my PhD now, it would be in something totally different. Because as you said, you have life experiences and you, through your life experiences, you find things that are that are different, you know. Um, because when you live in an academic environment, it's just academia all around you, all the time around you. But when you go into the real world, the real world, um, Things are very different, you know, academia and the real world are very, very different than, you know, my PhD would have been in a whole different different realm because I would have seen how the real world actually is. Um, not to say there's, there's correct or incorrect, it's just um, my, my journey would have been a little bit different if I had followed your, your pathway. That's pretty cool. I mean, you know, you have you never know what, what, what could happen, right, with, um, with life and ideas. The one thing I want to touch on, Eloise, is, um, is do you want to, I mean, you don't have to if you don't want to. Was there a, did you have... Um, any any struggles with mental health and well-being during your time at university the reason i i, I bring this up is um like i said before everyone says university is an amazing experience it is an amazing experience but there's also lots of challenges and sometimes those challenges increasingly affect well-being and mental health um you don't have to share stuff if you don't want to but it's just something i'd like to ask about if you're comfortable talking about that yeah um it is a it's a huge topic actually university um uh, mental health, particularly, I'd, I'd say, in postgraduate as well, when, like you say, you are feeling really isolated. Um, personally, uh, I think I manage myself quite well, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, because yeah, uh, I, I think what happened is that I had a lot of people around me who was struggling very seriously with mental health. Um, and I, uh, it, it was it was quite difficult actually to be, um, I think most of my, my mental health uh, was used up uh, being, trying to keep myself afloat, but also being a support person, um, which is, is an interesting experience. Um, also because you're, you're like, oh, my mental health's fine. Like I'm comparing myself to other people. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's huge. There's, there's like I had a lot of people really close to me who went through awful awful things um uh developing like agoraphobia or um suicide attempts uh and just uh, a lot of struggling with a lot of things like that like PTSD 
um, like serious OCD, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to, or even the struggle of trying to get different diagnoses for things that they were struggling with, um, which was very difficult in a university setting, especially when you don't have like a doctor that's assigned, like a family doctor that's yours, if you're just going to student health, or if you don't have the funds to be able to support yourself for that. Uh, I think one of the that was probably one of the biggest um, roadblocks that my peers went through was trying to get uh, actually the help that they needed, even when they wanted help. Um, uh, personally, I work quite hard on keeping my life quite balanced. Um, my, I, I, but I had the tools to be able to support myself. So my mother was a big part of that. She is a GP um, and she knows me very well. So she was able to like recognize that like, this is probably what I needed um, to, for my well-being. Um, and for me, that was like a really big mix of like doing sport a lot, keeping up exercise, um, maintaining what I was eating really well. So I feel like that slips quite a lot when you're a student um, uh, and that can really affect you. Um, keeping a balance between how you work, like how you study and how you have like leisure time, um, which is huge. Uh, making sure that you never study super late or get stressed out or anything like that. And um, it will keep involved in like creative side and make sure you have a social life, um, which are just like things that seem really unattainable a lot of the time, uh, unless you lay the foundations and groundwork for that. Um, uh, and uh, think because I was giving those tools at a really young age, I think I was able to, work through a lot of issues that I might have had. I struggled quite a lot in lockdown when I wasn't able to do those things. Um, I think also like I like uh, had a lot of anxiety, um, particularly as a child. And I think COVID really brought a lot of it back. Um, so I struggled with that quite a lot, uh, particularly during those lockdown periods. Um, but yeah, I think I think being able to recognize what you need is a is a huge skill and a skill that a lot of people don't have access to uh and not only that but like other steps actually seeking help and being able to access help and professional help is a huge barrier to a lot of people um particularly in university uh and um I feel like yeah that there was just a lot of a lot of um struggles that I recognize in people that I loved which was very difficult uh that's mostly mostly my biggest experiences yeah in uni I think you'll share that because I think you touched on a, on, a, on a couple of key points that you know awareness is awareness is really it's really important but also very hard when you're in a state where the world is just crumbling around you but you know and it's also the simple things you know the getting to sleep exercising being creative eating well you know those simple things which which are honed into us you know when we're growing up but when we get to university also when we're adults we forget about those things that you know like i said at the start we know what we need to do but we never do them you know um, we know we have to eat healthy we have to keep moving but why don't we do them and sometimes our mind space is such a space we don't look at those things there and it's pretty awesome that you that you that you were raised in a family and a father that that gave you that awareness there um, which is which is fantastic but it doesn't mean that you know when lockdowns happen doesn't mean that hey everything's hunky dory you know we it's a crazy world we don't know what's going to happen nobody nobody actually knew what was happening it's still at the moment nobody knows what's happening in the world so you know it's, it's okay to acknowledge that and go hey you know it's okay um but like you said before also you were a support person for others around you and i think universities or actually tertiary study is a very interesting time because it's not just about the tertiary trying to find your people it's also trying to find yourself those expectations and also um thinking that what you're doing is the norm is the right thing to do just because you've seen it happen before you know i've seen people do this so therefore i should i should go through this it's okay for me to be sad or do it because it's just okay um so it's awesome to have that awareness Eloise, we've been talking for almost an hour and i can't believe how how, how the time has blown i've learned so much today about just i mean about you which is amazing but also about ants i mean i never thought i'd learn a lot about ants today so that that's really awesome tana do you want to say anything before we round off the the, the podcast uh, not really it's just been awesome to reflect on things and to hear about your journey it's always awesome to hear about different fields and different things that are going on you know 
because sometimes we get so caught up in what's happening in our world that we don't actually step back and reflect on what's happening in other spaces. So it's been awesome to hear your story. Yeah, now, Louise, this is the hardest question that we ask all, all our guests, and we never we never we never tell people beforehand. The question I have for you is: our our podcast is called Paths of Knowledge. And what we try and do is we encourage our guests, aka you, to, to give us maybe one or two pieces of knowledge that you'd love people to build their past knowledge from your experiences so far. And this could be about anything that you that you would like to share. The wise words of Louise. Um, I would say that um, uh, be aware of how your interests and passions might fluctuate over time, uh, but also um, it's important to be accepting of that, I think, um, and to allow yourself to get into different interests and different passions and different areas of life because um, your perspective does change as you move around in the world and as you um, move to different cities or you meet different people or, um, you know, you just experience more of life. Uh, and I think particularly if, you're, if you're young, if you're a teenager, um, uh, you don't understand that. Uh, and I think it's important to, yeah, what I've learned is that it, it, is, it is important to be able to um, have, a, have, a, have a wide perspective and have an open mind and um, just allow yourself to find interest in everything that you come across. What a, what a great piece of knowledge there because I think a lot of a lot of us we when we're younger we get um, so fixed on, on an idea or a thought that just the thought or the idea of changing that because I've discovered something else is like oh no I've discovered I like this now what happens oh my life is in crisis and it feels like a crisis but it's okay to go wait a minute this is allowed you know like you said like you've said quite um, well throughout this whole conversation is how things have changed for you you know from a person that was Love that was looking at ants and insects and caterpillars when you were young to a person that was so into social justice, social change because of your queer community. That was the way you went. But then you're like, cool, this is what I'm going to do. But you change your mind and that wasn't a problem. Well, it, it, you change your mind to the sciences because you realize, okay, cool, wait a minute, I want to be intellectual, intellectual challenge. But the impact that you still had within the queer community was pretty massive at Wellington Girls. So it, it hasn't disappeared. And then as you were doing your, your, your study, you discovered when you were accepted to go to Brunei that changed your world altogether. And then um, during lockdown, you had one way which you were doing your project, then boom, a different way happened. And you know, you just never know when these moments will happen. So, um, you know, it's, and it's really awesome, but it's also awesome to hear and see what you're going to be doing with your life in the next, you know, whatever happens next, I'm pretty excited to what happens. Um, yeah, and I guess with that little monologue there of mine, um, I'd like to um, thank you for jumping on this podcast with us. And I'm sure our listeners out there would um, have learned a lot today. Um, any last words for them, Eloise, before we say goodbye to you? Oh, well, thank you for listening. Um, uh, I'm always happy to talk about even insects all the time, constantly. Um, <laughs> so thank you for giving the vehicle for that. <laughs> no worries. So for our listeners out there, if you want to, if, you, if you're interested in learning more about insects or want to contact Eloise to, to have a chat about things, um, jump onto our comments in any of our platforms and we'll get you in touch with her um, and as always thank you for listening to us um, please feel free to like subscribe comment on our podcast it is only through you that gets us to grow and we want this to go to lots of people to just explain how hey life is a roller coaster and just embrace the roller coaster till next time thank you everybody and don't forget to keep filling up your basket with some piece of knowledge bye